Sabancı Müzesi adına e, her birinize hoş geldiniz demek istiyorum. E, bu akşamki e, konuşmacılarımız e, Richard Deacon ve Lisa Lefov. Konuşmalarının başlığı da heykel meselesi olacak. E, Richard Deacon kimdir? Aslında önümüzdeki küçük notlarda uzunca yazıyor kim oldukları ama ben kısaca e, en önemli iki noktadan bahsedeyim. Richard Deacon Turner ödüllü hem e, güncel bir sanatçı, aynı zamanda sanat tarihi profesörü. Lisa Lafov ise e, o da e, Henry Moore Enstitüsü'nün e, küratörü, baş küratörü. E, bugün dediğim gibi bize heykel meselesini birlikte irdeliyor olacaklar. E, küçük bir not, e, e, aynı zamanda eğer sergiyi gezdiyseniz muhakkak görmüşsünüzdür, galeri eksi iki de. Anish Kapur'un e, Richard Deacon'a ithafen e, yaptığı bir eser de var. Eğer dikkatinizden kaçtıysa muhakkak onu da görmenizi tavsiye ederim. E, bu konferansı, bugünkü konferansı ve yarınki sanat tarihi öğrencileriyle, heykel taşlarla yapılacak etkiliği British Council'ın desteğiyle yaptık. Onlara da sizin huzurunuzda teşekkür ediyorum. Müze adına tabii ki. Ee, minik bir not, lütfen telefonlarınızın kapalı olduğundan emin olun, bizim için çok önemli. Ve sözü e, konuşmacılarımıza bırakıyorum. Şovu çalmadan tek bir not daha, haftaya bugün e, doçent doktor Ahu Antmen'in de bir konuşması olacak. Onu da bekliyoruz sizleri. The floor is yours. Mm, great, thank you very much and thank you very much. Um, for the invitation for both of us to, to come here. As far as um, I'm concerned, I can't think of anything better to be doing than to be in, an, in, a, in Istanbul and also talking sculpture with Richard Deacon. So what we're going to do is Richard is going to talk for maybe 20 minutes or so through um, a few ideas within his work. And then we will both be in conversation and we will argue, contest, and think through really why sculpture matters. Um, and both of us are, I think I can claim Richard the same as me, are rather obsessed with sculpture. So it's something that we really want to try and think through. Um, and the talk in total will last about an hour or so. Both of us can talk a lot, so we might have to finish quite abruptly. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening. And over to Richard. I don't, uh, and maybe there'll be some chance for some questions. Yes, if, uh, absolutely. Uh, if we like. <coughs> Good evening, and uh, um, thank you for coming tonight, braving the snow. Um, <coughs> so, as uh, Lisa indicated. Um, I'm going to do a very quick, uh, very quick. I'm going to do a run through of uh, um, uh, of work, and then a uh, piece of sculpture, and then uh, uh, we'll get on to talking about things in more general. So, so, um, and as requested, and since you've never seen, uh, most of you will never have seen pieces of my work. Uh, these uh, these images are all from uh, uh, from my own works, uh, and the beginning beginning in 1980 and uh, going up until last year, um, <coughs> and uh, so the first work you have on this screen is a work from uh, um, work from 1980, which is made of uh, laminated wood, and this is one of the first. Uh, First group of first group of works that um, uh, people saw and began to recognise as being uh, um, maybe interesting. So uh, the mic feels like it's just gone down, has it? Can you hear me, all right? Yeah. Um, um, of course, I've been making sculpture for some time before this. Um, uh, 1980, uh, uh, I'd already been making sculpture for 10 or 15 years, um, and uh, most of the earlier sculptures of mine uh, um, uh, started by being quite obsessed with materials and then with uh, a kind of performance in relationship to materials. Um, the 
I think what I learned when I was, what I tried to teach myself when I was a student, uh, without knowing what I was doing, but but uh, uh, was the intuitively I, I was unhappy about making things according to plans, um, and so a lot of the um, a, a lot of the earlier works um, were to do with somehow trying to. Uh, get rid of the idea of a plan, get rid of the end, uh, uh, get rid of an end in, in view and concentrate on a, um, uh, on the thing that was in front of me uh, without actually knowing how it was going to turn out. Um, and I think for painters this is probably quite a much, a much easier thing to, it's much easier to imagine that that's how a painter paints. A painter doesn't really kind of draw a drawing and kind of fill it in. He just the canvas is in front of them, and then uh, uh, and they have some ideas about how to how to proceed, and then the rest is uh, uh, to do. Uh, there may be a motif, there may be not, but the, the but the rest is to do with kind of trying to build something on the uh, on the canvas, and and you kind of understand that as a uh, uh, as a process in painting. There are odd exceptions. Um, Bridget Riley's paintings are mostly pretty planned out. Uh, but on the whole, that's how, you know that's uh, that painters proceed by uh, uh, that kind of um, uh, looking at what they're doing and modifying it. And uh, uh, whereas somehow people seem to think that sculptors need to know what they were doing before they start. And I uh, uh, and I um, uh, I found that quite difficult. Actually, I still do find it difficult really telling people what I'm going to do before I do it. Because uh, you may have a good idea, a, a different idea along the way. So the um, um, I looked at it during that kind of uh, first ten years. I looked at many different materials and many different ways of working with uh, uh, with materials, and also um, in a way like kind of learning to dance. Um, uh, was interested in the um, the ways in which. Uh, you as a body reacted to a lump of material, and all of those things kind of got built into the uh, built into the way the way it worked. So that by the 1980s, there the of early 1980s, there was a considerable backlog of uh, of things I'd done, and the, um, <coughs> and then the work seemed to then I seemed to kind of hit something that was that was um, pleasing to me, or kind of was. Uh, uh, core got me into a kind of rhythm of uh, uh, of making, and this so this first this first one is a laminated one, work made from uh, 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 thin pieces of wood laminated together, uh, and the things that you know the things that were interesting t um, to me about working with the material in that way was that. Um, by kind of bending and gluing things together, you started to build up a structure, uh, and the structure became self-supporting, and uh, uh, and progressively you kind of build the sculpture from itself, as it were. But, uh, um, and uh, and one thing led to another. So the uh, and that seemed to became a kind of seemed to become a kind of principle that you. Uh, um, um, that not only was I not pre-planning, but I somehow liked to kind of think of the sculpture as being being its own scaffolding, being its own uh, um, structure. I don't carve, um, and I never really have carved very much. Um, uh, I do model slightly more, but uh, uh, the majority of the work that I make is kind of built. Um, and then... Um, so I could quit me having talked so much at the beginning. Uh, I've probably not left myself with much time to talk about the individual pieces, but the uh, uh, but I'll go through them quickly. But this one um, on the screen now um, is actually the one uh, in the Kapoor exhibition. There's a work which is called for Richard Deacon, and this is so. This is the image that Anish remembers and. Uh, uh, and refers to in uh, the thing. And it was, it was a work that was shown uh, um, along with the previous one, uh, along with this one. Um, and each and I were, were uh, in a show called Objects and Sculpture uh, in uh, 1982, uh, which was a, breakthrough, a kind of breakthrough exhibition for both of us. Um, 
and uh, um, uh, certainly it's that which uh, and that was kind of also begun the process of my talking to a niche so uh, um, uh, the work uh, the work is uh, the work begins and it uh, um, adopts fairly fairly you know whole raft a whole raft of techniques um, the uh, this one is kind of rolled up in the same way she might roll a piece of paper. Uh, similarly for the next, um, and now I th now I'll start to go quite quickly through them. The um, uh, these works were quite big um, and uh, uh, made from kind of fairly common materials. Uh, I began looking for other materials that I wanted to, uh, other possibilities of making work. Uh, so this is in uh, um, a vine, a plastic. Um, uh, this is a marble and leather. Uh, and this is plastics with a, um, uh, two kinds of plastic and, st and stainless steel. So most of the, most of these are just bits of material that I found on the, uh, on the street. And these are all, these last three are all kind of moderately sized. Um, and then I got ambitious and uh, um, wanted to make work which kind of broke through the, uh, um, the uh, uh, broke away from the idea of a contained object um, and tried to, tried to sort of incorporate the gallery into a, or, or the enclosing space into the, um, into itself. So this is a work, uh, that has uh, that has two parts, one on the inside and one on the outside. This is the outside bit, and then the the glass in between the two, the membrane that separates the two, um, is also slightly altered, so that you can't uh, uh, you can't see in and you can't see out. Uh, but when you're uh, but when you're inside, the light the light. Uh, the light comes always comes from the outside, so that when you're on the when you're on the inside, uh, when you're on the inside, it's bright, um, and it uh, I installed extra lights so that it, uh, the lighting on the inside, from the outside in, just lets you see something, uh, in the same way in a kind of voyeuristic way you might see uh, someone in the bathroom. Um, the uh, most of these, um, how to how to do things, kind of continues to uh, preoccupy me, and how to uh, how to make um, uh, books. As I said, I really I don't carve. Most of it, most of my uh, uh, work is is kind of constructional, and uh, uh, some of the problems are familiar problems that you have. You know, if you if any of you are dressmakers. Uh, the problems of converting a kind of sheet, a flat sheet, into uh, something that conforms to uh, a body is, uh, uh, you know, has very close problems to the uh, very close constraints to the constraints that I have in making uh, sculpture, and then uh, uh, the, uh, the the problem of how you uh, um, make something which is three-dimensional, how uh, the map making problem that. Uh, um, if the thing is round, or if the thing is spherical, then the the surface doesn't flatten out. It can't. You, you can get. You can approximately get close to it. You can't actually flatten it, flatten it out. And <coughs> uh, a lot of the time, I got around that problem by making uh, work which has a kind of rib structure that the um, and the ribs define a the ribs define a volume, or by the kind of rolling up that I've uh, described earlier. But at some point. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, I've started to uh, um, want to, to find ways of materials and ways of working with materials which were more fully three-dimensional, which had a kind of bit of stretch to them. Um, and so, the, so these, uh, I began working in kind of clear plastic. Uh, 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 this is one in uh, uh, Clear plastic. I'm not really giving you the titles of these works, although the titles are important. Um, it just it maybe it confuses the issue. So, but uh, just to 
<coughs> indicate something like the this group this pair of works were called blind deaf and dumb and uh, <coughs> the reason for that was to do with somehow associating the membrane of the building with the perceptual membrane uh, of the eyes and the ears um, uh, this one is called uh, coat <coughs> for obvious reasons uh, and this one was called cover um, uh, which is made of uh, uh, copper kind of beaten in a kind of uh, um, into sort of puffy kind of cushion shapes and join uh, and joined together uh, and then this uh, last one uh, is called C uh, is made of uh, made of resin um, and the resin balls are formed over just piles of rubbish they were kind of uh, I tried to you tried to think of a kind of found um, a, a found three-dimensional form. It wasn't so much that I wanted a specific form, but I wanted something that was kind of uh, that was uh, th uh, three-dimensional. Um, and uh, uh, the bit in the middle is solid resin. So the uh, uh, the top and the bottom, the the the, uh, the shapes and the top and the bottom, kind of rise out of it like blisters. Um, so, so like blisters, like anything else. So, the, so the, the, uh, some at, at this point, I began sort of thinking a lot about flesh and kind of uh, uh, skin and uh, deter and ways in which the uh, surface of things gets uh, gets distorted, and uh, <coughs> and also in a more technical way. When I was bending the plastic, I needed to I needed to do it over a former. Uh, it couldn't be done in free. Uh, in free space, so I started to build form. So I built shapes um, that were dummies that were kind of that I could form the plastic over. And after a while, I got kind of more interested in the dummies than in the, uh, the than in the actual shape. So then the uh, uh, those then there's a series of works which are um, uh, as it were dummies. They're they're uh, um, uh, they're <coughs> Um, the insides, the outsides of an inside of something. They don't have a surface. They're like bits of, uh, they're like bits of meat, really. They're kind of, uh, kind of, uh, um, and I, uh, uh, and in a way, when I've been making works that had covers, I had were covered in pla When I was uh, using these as covers for uh, as formers for plastic, I'd been interested in the way that the the surface changed. Uh, with the, with the plastic on top, in the same way. I mean, you might not look at these things in the same way as uh, when you go to the supermarket. The stuff wrapped in plastic is very different from the stuff that is free, and there is there is some sense in which that barrier, that kind of uh, um, plastic, that thin film, changes the contents of what it is underneath. Um, so these are like that, with the, um, uh, but without a, without a top cover. Um, and they're blanks in a funny kind of way and then uh, uh, then I began to think of wonder about well um, I don't have to cover these things in plastic I could cover them in something else they could be uh, uh, what happens if I try and put a piece if I try and uh, uh, make wood go over the top of the uh, the cover which and this is the uh, and I I thought well then I could bend the wood and uh, it uh, it occurred to me that when um, there are certain there are certain kinds of quite cheap chairs which have bent wood uh, legs and arms and that the way in which they were bent which is just done using steam could be a possible route to uh, making uh, wood do making the wood bend. Um, so this was the first that used uh, uh, steamed wood as a kind of uh, uh, <coughs> as, a, uh, as a basic element in the in the structure, uh, and then this was the uh, uh, the next, which is you know remains the, the remains a sense in which this is a bit like a basket, 
and then that the basket becomes uh, um, uh, becomes the struct becomes the the drawing that makes the work. Um, and uh, uh, this is, this is made like a basket. There are three parts, three vertical pieces that are threaded together by six horizontal uh, pieces. There are they're not nothing is actually fixed together. The work is woven. Um, <coughs> and the, there's a photographic thing that, um, or a thing that's obvious from the photographs is that when you get close to it. Um, the work seems to be seems to be full. It seems it seems to be as much. Um, whereas almost everything else you've seen up to now, there's been a sense of there being an outside and an inside. Um, even if it's a even if it's a sort of semi-solid, um, it's the skin that's been important. Um, at this point, I began to think about making uh, the. Uh, it could be interesting to try and dispense with the skin, but try and have. A, uh, <coughs> um, a material that uh, uh, was present all through the solid, but had also um, uh, a, a kind of emptiness to it, or th that was also transparent. <coughs> so this idea occurred at this point, although actually it took quite a long time before I got and found any real solution to that. So. Uh, as an issue, it remained a kind of photographic idea that the, um, you could make a work which had uh, 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 where it's outside and inside were all kind of mixed up together. Um, there was some, uh, I thought there was a, so a possible solution might be in transparent plastic where the, um, the complexity of the structure view is kind of visible through to the other uh, on the other side but that uh, but I, uh, that was actually a kind of dead end this is the last of the plastic works that I made <coughs> and then the then the idea kind of went to sleep for a bit um, as it does sometimes and uh, uh, I began to think about other things I started doing some little drawings and the little drawings led to some little models and the little models led to some uh, very much larger ceramics uh, and these, uh, 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 so this is the end of the 90s that I started to make, uh, started to have a fairly kind of major production in ceramics. <coughs> um, and you can see from the table here that the, uh, there's really quite a lot of different possibilities that, that, became, uh, um, uh, that became apparent. I said at the beginning that I didn't like to plan things. Um, and uh, uh, this is the closest I've got to really having plans. Is is actually making these uh, uh, making these numerous small models, <coughs> and then enlarging them up. Uh, so all of the, these are in uh, um, raw clay, and then the larger ones are uh, um, <coughs> in glazed uh, in glazed form. Uh, and this is a, so. This gives you a better idea of the scale. This is an exhibition of the uh, um, in 2003 of the ceramics. But the uh, the idea about wood hadn't hadn't gone away. So uh, this is to remind you that. Uh, and uh, uh, at, uh, at some point, I then uh, um, I made several large large work, large complex works, and. But the, the, the idea that you could make um, this uh, a kind of elaborate object that, was, uh, that had neither inside nor outside, that was just uh, uh, composed of a surface that kind of went in and out, uh, remained. Uh, and this was the first, this is a, a multi-part multi work, uh, which is perhaps the first instance of it. And then, uh, uh, and then this, uh, this is a kind of solution where the... Uh, <coughs> all those parts come back together again. Um, the work's called out of order in this case. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a single line is joined by uh, uh, all these other looping, swirling bits. And then the line itself becomes the subject of a uh, uh, inquiry. So that the, uh, the, the, the line that goes around all of these uh, itself becomes something that can be kind of opened up and uh, uh, explored, and the line itself may contain uh, 
uh, that contains within it a volume. So this is a, so a line is then uh, unpacked and opened up, and this has several um, uh, iterations of this as, uh, of that as an idea. And these are something like these are the, the most recent where there is uh, um, the ends are kind of cut off and you have two different kinds of pattern fusing together uh, and the line just uh, um, uh, so rather than it being a circumscribing line it's just a, uh, uh, it's just it's a line that goes between these two different uh, two different patterns um, one is a uh, um, a square, a pattern of squares at this end and the other end is a pattern of diagonals. Um, uh, and they're the same, but the, a similar thing, but the, uh, the obviously it descends from one to the other. <coughs> um, the central space that's within the work, um, that uh, the, the empty uh, um, <coughs> the empty space that the work, uh, the work contains. Sometimes that's been like the size of the studio. So sometimes it's feel like the, when I make a work, I just sort of wrap up the studio. Uh, and then what, what the work contains is the studio. Uh, but that, uh, all of these kind of approaches to construction um, are a bit about kind of wrapping up a, uh, a, vo uh, 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 a, a space. Uh, and that that space can then uh, <coughs> um, um, uh, and what that what the contents of that space are as space is also becomes a uh, you know and the nature of that space of that uh, empty uh, the nature of that space itself also becomes a, uh, an issue so uh, this is from 2007 an installation when uh, you know uh, in Venice, uh, when uh, I used a uh, um, uh, an old brewery, the room of an old brewery, and all the work is kind of dis is pushed to the edges and the outsides, um, as if you were in inside uh, a work, and it's kind of uh, pushed, uh, and things are pushed to the outside, um, and the uh, that empty space, I think, in part. The, or the, que the reason why that empty space was becoming uh, uh, interesting for me <coughs> was that I'd also begun uh, to make uh, ceramic work, which kind of took itself off from an idea about carving uh, or hollowing out a, uh, an empty space. So that uh, um, the origin for a work like this is a uh, is a solid which has been carved, which has been hollowed out, just leaving the edges behind. <coughs> and then those, and you have a you have a work which relates to this group, um, actually here in Istanbul, outside the uh, museum, um, which is the materials change, but the uh, the process of making has been was similar, in that the uh, the very the very first uh, idea is a solid, and then the solid is emptied out, and that and that emptied out solid becomes the. Uh, um, um, the, the drawing or the kind of the diagram for construction, uh, but it also allows you to, allows me to combine things in ways which uh, uh, would be very, very difficult would be very diff difficult to imagine. And so these uh, uh, so this is two that have been kind of fused together. Uh, they they share a certain, they share one face, um, and the idea of twinning was was kind of in, was. Has been important. Uh, so they can they, sh they can either share a space or they can share a volume. So this is three which have been woven together. Um, the um, um, and making uh, making things which have. Uh, um, these kind of parts they get they, they uh, uh, trying to make a jump now, which is so the um, the individual elements of these uh, let's go back to this um, these indi individual forms um, can also become kind of 
separated out, but you can think of them as being kind of uh, uh, like free free floating elements. So the um, if you imagine this uh, this being this broken up and then recombining, you get some you get to somewhere like this, um, uh, where the individual uh, uh, individual parts are kind of held together uh, in a rather kind of precarious uh, uh, precarious geometry, as if the thing's been broken and then uh, uh, reassembled, and that <coughs> and that exists and that uh, has all sorts of uh, other uh, solutions and the um, or other ways of, ways of doing things, uh, and the individual elements themselves, those uh, um, geometric folded forms, uh, also <coughs> can can then change to another material and become a different way of structuring. So this is that now these are these works are made from paper uh, folded up. Uh, and then the paper can go back to uh, being clay. Uh, so the, this is a large work in clay, which is uh, in, in ceramic, which is made, it's, it's uh, just under four meters high, so really quite a large work, um, uh, folded together. So the uh, uh, one last uh, group, <coughs> Uh, I've also been working flat in reliefs uh, in various ways trying to make things which configure a uh, uh, conform to a, um, uh, a set of drawings there's 26 drawings and they're called alphabet and each uh, so each time I've tried to make the uh, uh, <coughs> the realized drawing made to be made in a slightly different way so this is stained as folded stained as steel this is beaten, this is cut and beaten aluminium, uh, this is folded stainless steel with colour on the inside, etc. So e each of these drawings, each of these large wall matted reliefs is, a, um, <coughs> uh, is both a different shape but also the material used in a slightly different way. And that, uh, and the packing together, so uh, there is, a, there is Another theme in the work is, is a kind of transfer between one, two and three dimensions. Um, and uh, so that you can also think of those, uh, 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 of this as being like a flattened diagram. Uh, and that flattened diagram then leaves you, leads you up to something like this. <coughs> uh, and that's um, roughly where I am at the moment. So this is an exhibition in New York. Uh, last year, where you have uh, in one half of the exhibition these rather geometric shapes, which are related, which are related to ideas about folding, cutting, pressing, hollowing out, etc. And then in the other, uh, in the other part of the gallery, uh, a set of much more, much more or organically curved works, um, uh, which relate to. <coughs> ideas about um, uh, a kind of <laughs> modular construction and about um, uh, and about the way in which drawing uh, and volume uh, evolve it in the work. So the um, <coughs> uh, yeah, that's it. So this is the last slide. Thank you very much. And it went on too long. Sorry. No, I mean. contest that you went on too long. You've just taken us through from 1980 to 2012, um, which is a long trajectory of a series of not just sculptures, but developments within sculptural thinking. And I'd like, if I may, Richard, to ask you, I think I'm going to try and limit myself to ask you just three questions so that we can make sure we've got enough time to open up for a broader discussion and questions, but just in case no one has any questions, that's just fine. That means I can ask Richard some more questions and use up the time in some way. And um, one of the things that really struck me, Richard, when you started talking about um, your work that you made before this moment in, in 1980, and it seems to me very relevant throughout all, all of your work, is this phrase that you used about learning to dance with an object. Um, 
And I think it's, it's a very beautiful way of describing sculpture that's very much about um, a visceral and palpable and bodily encounter with the sculpture. And I wanted to ask you that it seems that if you, as the maker of the sculpture, is learning to dance with it, so learning to shift from being slightly awkward, stepping on the toes of your dancing partner, being quite self-conscious, to then working very intuitively, there's a moment when you feel that you can pass your dancing partner, so pass the sculpture onto someone else that being us, the people who encounter it. So when is it that you know that's the, that it's the right time to pass on that dancing to somebody else? Um, it used to be quite difficult uh, to know when I'd finished something. Um, it's much easier now. Uh, the, um, a lot of the work that I made in the 1970s was kind of worked to death, really. Um, and it was, uh, um, uh, and it's full of kind of hesitations and uncertainties and sort of modifications. And uh, um, the, uh, there's a group of drawings that I made in the, uh, uh, at the end of the 70s, which are, which are quite kind of important in that, in that uh, the drawings themselves have this kind of very dense network of lines and kind of, uh, um, uh, and thinking on the surface. Uh, but in, in drawing, uh, that seems like a positive result rather than just sort of uh, um, <coughs> uh, hesitations. Uh, I mean, it, seem, it seems to have a kind of richness to it. Uh, and from those drawings, I was able to extract a, uh, I was able to extract a, uh, uh, a series of, uh, uh, within, within that mesh of lines, a series of definitive uh, uh, definitive ending. So it was um, um, uh, the experience that it w of, that actually was possible to bring things to a conclusion uh, was uh, was was quite important. Um, I did uh, uh, in '83 when I asked myself this question. I did answer very glibly. Um, I did say I'm never sure that I finish with something or what it finishes with me. It finishes with me. Um, as a solution, as, as an answer to that, but the uh, um, uh, I do um, I do like finishing things. I do like uh, um, um, them being them being out in the world. And uh, in ceramic, in the ceramic works, it's kind of a bit easier because there's a model making process. So you have you have something to kind of. Uh, and also, it's a kind of the ceramic is also no uh, uh, is also another another good education. The ceramic is a kind of uh, uh, isn't a two way street. Most of the um, most of the wooden works or the steel works that I've made, you can think of as being kind of demountable. You can kind of go backwards, but ceramics you can't go backwards. Uh, once it's been fired, that's it. You can't. Uh, it doesn't go back to being clay again. Um, the uh, uh, um, uh, so the, to answer to answer the question, really, uh, I think you just learn how to uh, uh, you learn when to stop. Mm -hmm. And in, in a way, this really underlines how important within your sculptural practice these the use of, of uh, ceramics is, because it's there's as you just described, there's no going back. Um, and when you began working in ceramics, was it an immediate um, moment when you were happy with the result, or did you go through a number of dead end streets? Oh, okay, there are a number. There are. Um, well, there's, um, it's interesting with, with with ceramic, particularly the glazed ones. Well, most of them are glazed. Um, I'm not very good at painting things. Uh, the uh, uh, painting, although I've just recently done a whole series of painted works, uh, painted steel works, but the, uh, <coughs> um, uh, I suffer a little bit from a sense, from a kind of slightly Protestant sense that uh, work should, uh, or, or maybe it's not Protestant, but I think that uh, uh, work is an element uh, mm -hmm. and uh, is a part of the, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be hard work, but somehow, uh, 
when you, it's to do with time, that somehow work conveys time, and the evidence of work, it, it, the kind of markings on the surface, the screws and everything, shouldn't, uh, when you paint it, it seems to eliminate time in the piece. And uh, <coughs> so I've, I've, been, uh, I've been reluctant to paint things. Um, although, you know, at, at early stages when I did a lot of laminating, I began to think of the glue as like a paint, mm. the, the, the kind of a paint that had no, uh, uh, that was a bit out of control, a bit naughty. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, glazing, um, most of the time when the, these big ceramic works are glazed, um, <coughs> they're glazed before they're fired once, so that so it's only a single firing, so they're raw glazed, uh, and the. Uh, um, uh, and with, with putting glaze on, uh, you've actually got no idea what it's going to look like. So uh, uh, painting is a, uh, um, it's like stand being blindfolded with a paintbrush really, that you, uh, uh, someone hands you a pot and says it's blue and you say, okay, I'll put that on. Um, and you're, so you, what you, the surface you put on, uh, and, uh, and it is quite inhibiting I think when you, uh, when you paint, because there's so much history, um, but if you actually can't see what you're doing, then then it's then it gets a bit easier because uh, you can you can put it on and imagine that what you're doing uh, is not like anything that's ever happened before. Uh, and then when it comes out, it isn't like anything you imagined, but it isn't also like anything that's happened before. So the uh, and the, the so both the firing and the glazing kind of finish something off in a very kind of absolute way. Um, uh, I have put things back in for a second glazing, but really it's not, it's not a great idea. Um, the, uh, so y unlike almost anything else that I do, I mean, this is a really kind of like, it's like printing. There's a deadline, uh, bang, and it's fired. I'd, I'd also like to ask you about your encounter with the sculptures of others. And you said something when you were talking that really surprised me. Um, when you were talking about a particular sculpture in relation to a photographic idea of inside and out. And I've always perhaps completely erroneously imagined that um, as a sculptor you wouldn't necessarily approve of photography as a means through which one can encounter a sculpture. So my understanding of your work has always been that it's very much about this immediacy. So when you stand in front of the sculpture, you feel your own physical relationship to it. It's about scale. It's about the subjective moment of the encounter. And yet photography is a really difficult um, traveling companion for sculpture because what you're doing is you're seeing the sculpture through somebody else's eyes. It's not a physical encounter. And yet you're utilizing that means of seeing to think through making an object. And could you talk perhaps a little bit more about your relationship with the representation of sculpture through photography? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, I grew up in the city. I went to, to art school in the beginning of the 70s when uh, photography was a kind of hot issue in relationship to sculpture. And uh, uh, it was entirely possible to imagine a photograph as a sculpture. Uh, and Richard Long has built a whole kind of uh, um, career on an idea that a photograph can be a piece of sculpture. Um, and the, um, a lot of my early, a lot of the early performance works, uh, I didn't document in photographs. Actually, I didn't take photographs, but I wrote about them. And I treated the photograph, the writing, like photographs, um, or I wrote about what happened between photographs. Um, so I would just see two photographs and describe what happened between one and the other. Um, the one serious attempt I had to use rigorous photographic documentation was uh, a series of works of uh, it was a work I made about the sounds that you could make with your body, you know, the kind of claps, the kind of that. And it was a set of instructions. Um, and the, the piece consisted of this list of instructions, 
a photograph of me performing the actions with a, um, a, a stop clock in the photograph and a tape recorder so that all of the uh, uh, recording apparatus was indexed. Uh, and it was really quite a dead end. But the, uh, um, but the camera, the, the, the camera itself, I'd, I'd always kind of, uh, um, I'd always had cameras, and I've always, always been kind of interested in cameras, you know, and uh, uh, I can describe all the cameras that I've ever owned, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and why, and why, and why I like them. Uh, and I used to print my own photographs as well. Um, and the, um, I mean, I think it's changed now. I think it's so, so it would change for uh, most of the people in this audience. They wouldn't have the same relationship to photography. I think, I think actually, a photograph, photography is a very sculptural act. Uh, in the in, in the light impinges on a photosensitive plane uh, and causes something to happen, and that the uh, and that kind of hitting of the light on the photosensitive surface, I think, is a, uh, um, is a physical action. Uh, I think it's different with an electronic, uh, and it's holistic, it happens all over the surface. I think it's different with digital, I mean, the, in the, it's the image that's become the, the issue, whereas the photograph is an object. Um, uh, um, and um, I got a bit baffled by the change to digitalization, but uh, I've kind of got over that now. Um, um, but I think that the the history of sculpture between um, when 1963, 60, 60, 63 to about 1980 is deeply involved in uh, uh, black and white photography and later on in early kind of video forms. Uh, and that the thinking about the uh, the object which goes on in relationship to um, film, camera, uh, object, um, and uh, um, I mean, all that 70s work is really, really so involved in photography. Um, but it uh, but it's a very sculptural kind of um, um, it's a it's a very sculptural involvement. Um, the, <coughs> but I think there's also an, um, I mean, on, on this presentation I use that, uh, um, I use that image just to, just as a, an aid memoir for the audience. Um, but in the, uh, uh, when I went to Dundee and, um, go right back now. Uh, when I went to Dundee in 2000, I stood at this. No. I can't go back fast enough. Um, the, there's an image of the I made a I made a set of I made that work which has um, 15 parts. All those all those. Uh, um, on one of the visits to Dundee, when we were talking about it, uh, when I was trying to work out uh, the curator's woman called Katrina Brown, uh, and I was trying to work out a way to uh, uh, <coughs> use the space, and I'd been I'd been thinking, and oh, we're getting there. Okay. I've been trying to work out a way on how to use the space, and uh, um, uh, and I've been thinking about these uh, uh, twists and turns and cons making constructions out of uh, pieces of wood bent bent in a spiral. Um, and on a very early visit to Dundee, flying over uh, uh, flying over the river and looking down out of the plane, the airport in Dundee is right by the River Tay um, uh, and looking down the tide was coming in uh, and off the sandbank was a kind of really beautiful spiral in the water um, and I so I kind of took and I took a photograph out the window of the airplane 
Um, and then I forgot completely about it. Um, and then sometime later when we were starting to kind of get the catalogue ready for the show, I was just looking to find some images and I found this image and I realised that there was uh, um, uh, there was kind of quite a deep connection between that, uh, seeing that spiral uh, and the work that I'd done. Uh, but so then the photograph then reminds me of something that I'd seen but forgotten, um, but which had a, uh, uh, but which... Uh, I think probably influenced the way, the way I thought about what to do. Um, it quite, you know, it surprised me because otherwise, if I hadn't taken the photograph, then I wouldn't have remembered it, um, and uh, um, or I wouldn't have, no, I wouldn't have remembered that I'd seen it. Uh, uh, although the seeing of it uh, quite possibly influenced the way that I was the the kinds of things I was thinking about. Mm. I mean, in, in a way, and I'll make this my my last question. Um, in a way, that really brings us to the title um, of our talk today, which is Why Sculpture Matters. And I'd like to make a provocation and to see really what, what your opinion of it is, Richard. It's, it seems to me that one of the reasons why sculpture is so important is that it's absolutely about being human. So there's this wonderful thing that the American artist Lawrence Wiener says far more beautifully than, than I possibly could. He says that human beings make objects to try and understand their place in the world. And we also have to understand our place in the world by negotiating these objects. This is why sculpture is so important, because it's a means of rethinking these objects. And when one encounters sculpture that really matters, it's a process of entirely recalibrating one's perceptions of the world that surrounds you. And within this, it's really essential to remember that sculpture, or I believe sculpture, isn't about the world. It's of the world. So it exists within, within our existence, within our, our perception. Is that something that you hold with, Richard? Uh, I think it's a two-way process, and this is quite a useful image to uh, talk about it in relationship to two-way processes. The... Um, um, uh, the HMV record label is uh, um, of the ma of the dog sitting in front of the old uh, um, gramophone with that kind of horn. Um, uh, always struck me as being a kind of very useful diagram for the way that sculpture works. In that, um, the uh, and the sculpture in that case, I think, is the horn. Um, and uh, the horn is either transmitting, you know, so the dog is listening to what the horn is saying, um, or else, it, but it, it's also receiving. The dog could be talking into the. Uh, you know, it goes two way. It's a two way process with the with that kind of uh, thing. And so there is a um, the a sculpture meter seems to me to be in between, uh, the, as both transmitter and receiver. That it. Uh, is a kind of filter or a, uh, a way of uh, um, uh, a way through which we understand the world, but also a way in which um, uh, um, uh, the uh, but also a way in which the world is created, so that the um, uh, and the the kinds of relationship I think people have to um, the sculptures I make, and I think to sculptures in general, is that they're uh, um, they're in conversation with the uh, uh, with the sculpture, and the sculpture has um, uh, is between their experience and uh, and the uh, and the world, uh, and it's a um, it's like a, it's like a conversation. Mm. It's a, um, um, and it's what's um, uh, it doesn't give you messages, but somehow there's a uh, there's a uh, a way of that the sculpture uh, uh, relates to you and says things to you, just the way, just in the same way as you say things to it, um, and that the um, uh, and it's a material. It's kind of uh, it's a uh, but it's uh, um, and it was in the one of the 
the very beginning of the 80s, no, sorry, the, in the mid-70s, um, there was quite a, uh, uh, a part of that kind of, di of the discourse around uh, sculpture making had to do with kind of literalness, um, particularly in relationship to minimal art. That uh, um, and uh, uh, those kind of heroes of American minimalism tended to describe the work as in terms of wanting it to be uh, factual, real. In, in fact, and indeed, there was a show called After the Real. Um, but the uh, but I um, uh, but I was I was never sure that that was the. Uh, I think the real is interesting, and I think. Make the to to sort of say an aspiration. I want to keep it as keep the paint as good as it is in the can. Is a kind of interesting assertion about materiality. Or uh, I want to make sculpture like counting one, two, three. I think there are there are interesting assertions. Um, but what they don't allow for is the kind of discourse that invo that is involved that allows a statement like that to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's um, uh, if it's just I want to make keep the paint as good as it was in the can, you can say, so what, you know, what's yeah. that mean, you know, uh, it's just paint. But so the, the, there, is, there is also a discourse within the, which allows us to believe that the, uh, the work of art um, has the potential to carry uh, any, a, a number of meanings. It never, it's never really clear what that meaning is, but it, you know, has the potential to, and it's the, uh, and that's what we or you bring to it we kind of bring uh, we allow in, in the way that we look at it we allow that discourse to happen mm -hmm. thank you oh i want to ask you many more questions but i i won't i will try not to be selfish does anyone have any thoughts comments contestations or otherwise at all yeah, yeah. There's a microphone just coming. Thank, Thank you. you. I do. I would like to learn the, um, how this art making process, actual building process, transform you, transform your thoughts and transform your inner self. Because you are very comfortable when you're talking about how you made something or how you built something. But what I see from here is that you are a bit shy when you're talking about your own emotions and the approach of your work, approach of yours to, to, towards your work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm shy. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, um, uh, I'm cautious in giving too much away uh, because uh, um, these things matter to me, uh, and uh, um, and I need to trust you before I can give it all away. Um, um, <coughs> you, how does the um, uh, well making does give me a certain confidence? Yes, in in how I uh, uh, in how I deal with the world <laughs> and. Uh, um, uh, and a certain amount of self-reliance, and I think self-reliance leads to um, uh, a more comfortable relationship with the world. Uh, um, I've had jobs, um, and I've worked for other people, uh, but most of my um, uh, the way that I've earned um, my living, I've been very lucky. I've mostly been working for myself. Uh, and uh, uh, that gives you a kind of independence, I think. So the, um, uh, I think I'd add to your question as to what, uh, because I think the economics also does change the situation as well. Um, uh, in both in terms of the kinds of scale of thing you can do, um, but also the feeling or uh, f certain feelings about uh, about value. If I'd made all the works that you've seen and they were still in my store, then it would be 
quite hard, I think, and I do know artists of my age who really have had no um, um, equivalent exposure to the exposure that I've had, who continue to make things, and I think they're truly heroic. Uh, I can't imagine how to, that I, I don't know if um, I would still, I'm sure I'd still be messing around, but I'm not sure I'd still be making um, sculpture on this, on this kind of scale if I hadn't had any support. Um, the, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, the kinds of relationships that I have, um, it's not always the good that you or uh, um, th that I'm very focused on what it is that I'm doing. Um, uh, it sometimes means I ignore the people who are nearest me. Uh, so there's a, you know there are some costs involved as well. Um, the um, uh, in terms of the kind of direct meanings of the wo of, of works. Um, uh, it is a difficult area because I think my work is founded on a certain kind of ambiguity, um, not in not in material terms, but in actual, um, uh, but in coming coming to a conclusion. I did say in response to a, um, a question of Lisa's that I actually liked finishing things. It's true, uh, I do like finishing things, but I don't like finishing things in such a way that it's all tied up. Uh, so stopping before the end is also perhaps a part of finishing. Mm. Okay? That's good. Anyone else at all? Yes. Um. Um, as a curious art observer and lover, I'd like to ask you a question. As an artist and a sculpture maker, I've used popular term, um, as an artist, do you believe that there is, there needs to be a seek of aesthetic and artistic value in your art, or do you usually use the pure and imagination in your works? And furthermore, do you believe that there is an aesthetic value in modern arts and the contemporary sculptures itself? It's a big question. <laughs> um, the um, I think the uh, it's easier to start from small things than it is to start from big things. Uh, I think it's hard to set out to make a work about death, for example, or about love. Um, uh, I think those things can emerge. Um, uh, I've often started to make work about um, uh, very small things. Uh, certain kinds of experience uh, and I think the progress from the particular to the general is um, uh, allows uh, allows things to grow if I set out to make a work about a big theme then in the end I'm reducing it down uh, and uh, um, uh, and that seems to restrict its uh, uh, restrict the possibilities rather than to uh, enlarge the possibilities. Um, and it's also uh, um, uh, most of the time the place I start is, is something that I kind of stumble across, um, uh, something that attracts my attention. And it's, it's, the, it's curiosity, I think, that creates the, uh, um, and a certain kind of idleness, you know, a certain kind of speculation, a certain, <laughs> certain willingness to uh, um, uh, let things drift uh, that allows the uh, uh, that allows the work to develop. Of course, once it's finished, then that's something else. Um, once it's finished, then you you can become a uh, um, um, a protagonist for the work and kind of really start to kind of. Uh, um, it's hard to do it for yourself, but, you, but uh, uh, I can do it for other people to start to uh, proclaim its value. Um, uh, yes, I think uh, the work has the works have aesthetic value. Uh, I think it's uh, 
uh, I think the value of aesthetic value is not is that it's kind of uh, um, free of ends. It's free of uh, um, uh, it's free of ideology. Um, is uh, in if I look at the history of the work that I've made uh, over over these many years, I can relate them to uh, um, <coughs> either uh, to particular events or to uh, uh, particular situations. Um, the uh, uh, the last exhibition I made at the Listen Gallery was called Association, um, and. Uh, um, uh, and it was called that because it, because of uh, uh, I've become kind of interested in the way the ways in which social structures, uh, whether they were political, or familial, or religious, um, had become such kind of dominant forms in the uh, in the ways we we look at the world. So that the the titles of the work uh, reflected, in a sense, that sort of uh, uh, engagement with. Um, the way in which how things are put together in a sculpture um, can um, um, have connections to the how we put how we how things are put together in the world, uh, and how things are put together in the world isn't just to do with materiality, but has also to do with sets of rules, sets of constraints, a social situation, etc. Um, <coughs> I think there are works that I've made which are beautiful. Um, and, and I think uh, 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 beauty is kind of homeless in the world, uh, and um, it's not, uh, um, but it's not valueless. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I think we can probably have two more questions. Yes, and can you just wait for the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> why did you? Um, why are you not making smaller sculptures anymore? Uh, the question is, has to do with the importance of size. Um, as you said in the beginning, not, not, not much is cast, not much is um, carved. Um, I think a lot of the problematic and some of the materiality in the way you, you, you assembled work almost has to do uh, with the jewelry making, you know, the use of rivets, the use of small objects put together. Um, what's important of size in your work and why don't you make smaller sculptures anymore? Mm -hmm. uh, I do make smaller sculptures. Uh, um, the uh, uh, depends on what size you want to call small. Well, I, actually, yeah, I was yeah, thinking of the, infinitely uh, small, like almost jewelry size, you know, because um, I, I feel there's something that when you work, it could be almost infinite, infinitely bigger, infinitely smaller. I have a group of work called Small Sculptures, uh, which are about this big, um, and I mean they are quite hard to make because they they do uh, um, um, they're no easier to make than they're, they're no harder or no easier to make than bigger sculptures are. There are different kinds of problems, um, and uh, uh, they're no faster to make than, than bigger. Sculptures may be a little bit faster, but uh, um, the um, uh, size is. Uh, I'm interested in the boundaries of size. Um, there are um, uh, there are things. Um, and. English critic called Lynn Cook once wrote a text when she suggested that um, the, home, the, the natural home for contemporary sculpture was the museum. Uh, and I thought, well, hang on a minute, that's putting the cart before the horse. Um, mm -hmm. And that the uh, home, that the, the, the size range um, should be such that it uh, um, uh, only some of the so, some of the production could fit within the within the home. Uh, when I was showing these images, I did show a uh, uh, quite early on um, a set of works where I tried to kind of push through the walls of the building, 
Um, but equally, the group of works that I've made before that were intent that I showed before before that the small, much smaller works. Um, I think the location of uh, um, uh, their location was uh, uh, intended to be almost anywhere. They could, they didn't have to be uh, inside. I wanted to make works that can sit on the top of houses as well as works that can sit um, uh, that can sit in the corner. The uh, there is perhaps a top edge. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the uh, um, uh, there come there comes a point when the size I think becomes very tricky. Uh, and I've thought about this uh, a long t for a long time. Uh, I did make a show called The Size of It um, in 2005, which tried to uh, at least not not answer the question, but uh, was uh, there were very small things and very big things, uh, and I wanted to know what the connection was between the very small and the very big. Um, um, I'm not interested in making architecture, so I don't know where sculpture stops and architecture starts. You know, there's, uh, uh, I don't think I've ever wanted to make a sculpture you can live in, um, but I would be quite interested in making a sculpture that use uh, the I'm really quite interested in making sculpture that uses architecture as a base you know so that uh, I'm interested in houses uh, as a kind of base for a piece of sculpture and if you look at a lot of 19th century imperial cities imperial cities in particular somewhere like Vienna uh, there's a lot of sculpture on the roofs of buildings and I find that quite a look at quite an interesting location of the way in which the uh, the building is used as a base for the uh, for the sculpture uh, I think sculpture you can wear is also interesting. I mean, I think jewellery is uh, um, uh, both either as clothes or as jewellery. You know, so the um, the interesting thing about and I have made my own clothes. You know, I'm interested. In, I think the um, um, although they're quite conventional, but you know, the, the f to make something which is given form by a body, I think is uh, um, uh, is interesting. So the um, uh, so size does matter, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, and I I do try and make things which are specific in their size. Um, I've very rarely made things which are uh, continuously expanded. Um, you know that um, the only the only works which have a relationship of a small to big are the set of ceramic works and generally uh, there's a kind of ten times between the small model and the big um, but almost all everything else is made at full size and doesn't exist in another form another size so I do think size uh, I do have a s opinion that size is specific to the work um, so the work is really site specific in a way. Size, not site. So the, the well, how big it is. You said that how, um, how, how, big, it, how big it is. Uh, um, the things aren't infinitely changeable. Henry Moore um, and Lisa think, might argue about this. Uh, <laughs> Henry Moore's sculptures often exist in se or Rodin sculptures often exist in several different sizes. Um, uh, I think that's. I think you should know what size something is. Because you, you, you mentioned that most <coughs> very often the, the, the sculpture was inspired by the space that you were given. Sometimes it that, is, yes. That you were in, in that Dundee thing it is, yes. Mm. Sometimes it's inspired by the space. In, I didn't show you any uh, permanent commissions on these things. Uh, in those cases, they're almost all size or site related. Uh, I've never made a commission of public work which isn't um, constructed according to the site. Thank you. Um, one last question. Yes. Can you just wait for the microphone? Thank you. Merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. Ben öncelikle şunu söyleyeceğim. Ben sanat eserlerini sanatçının mahremi olarak görüyorum. Yani bir siz özelinizi, ruh dünyanızı bizimle paylaşıyorsunuz. 
Bu aslında çok cesaret gerektiren, takdire şayan bir durum. Ama size sormak istediğim, yani özellikle eserlerinizde anlaşılır olmak e, ya da özellikle ilginç olmak kaygısı taşıyor musunuz? Çünkü az önce söylerken e, ilginç olarak daha neler yapabilirim diye düşündüğünüzü söylemiştiniz. Yani genel olarak eserlerinizde karmaşık bir ruh hali görüyorum ben. E, şahsen böyle bir şey hissettim. E, bu karmaşık ruh halinizin etkisiyle e, mi? Yani ilginç mi olmak istiyorsunuz yoksa e, hani bir ilginç olmak kaygısı taşıyor musunuz? Özellikle bunu sormak istiyorum. <gülüyor> oh, that's a great question. <gülüyor> a very hard question to answer. Um, well, I'm not interested in being boring. Uh, though, uh, um, um, though personally, uh, I quite like the situation w where uh, I'm idle, but not. Um, <coughs> Uh, it's not a question of being bored, because if, you, if you're bored, you kind of, uh, you don't know what to do. But I quite like the situation where you're kind of think you should be doing something, but you're not quite sure what it is. So there's a, um, uh, this, the, um, um, the thing, um, The things that okay, the things that I think interest me are things that I'm not sure about. I'm, I don't really know what they are, um, and uh, um, so <coughs> uh, and I think that's probably a quality that I'd like the work to have. That it's um, uh, that it's clear, but it's not. Um, it's a bit. You're a bit unsure about. It what it is. So I don't know if that counts as being interesting. Um, the, um, I mean, I think it was, there was an American artist who said all, all you have to, all it has to do, all the work has to do is be interesting. Uh, I think, who said that? Judd, I think. Yeah, well, he said all, all, yes, I think it is Judd. All the work has to do is be interesting. And interesting became a, uh, a value-free description. Um, <laughs> Uh, that it doesn't, it wasn't to do with subject, it just that you just have to somehow engage. Uh, so on that level, yes, I'd like to be interesting. Uh, um, and uh, 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 and, it's, and actually being interesting is also not, um, uh, is not defined. Um, so Uh, I'm also uh, so I am interested in not being defined. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I like living in London is because um, one of the when I went to, when I went to London when I was a student, one of the things that attracted me about St Martin's School of Art was that uh, um, St Martin's was at the time situated in the middle of London on the edge of Soho. Uh, and you could leave St. Martin's and as soon as you walked out of the door you became anonymous, you became just part of the crowd. Uh, and then when you stepped back into St. Martin's you stepped back into something that was, uh, uh, that was completely different. Whereas uh, other friends of mine that were in much smaller cities were always identified as students. Um, and, it was, and it was that sense of being able to um, Uh, reinvent yourself uh, every day from being uh, uh, from the street to the school that, uh, that intrigued me and I think that's a, a feature of London life in general that um, uh, it's not unfriendly uh, but the uh, um, uh, but it doesn't mean you don't have to define yourself um, <coughs> you can kind of reinvent yourself as uh, as uh, as the day goes on or as the weeks pass. Um, and um, the, the structure of the city uh, allows, that, allows that to happen. In smaller places, um, then 
you kind of get defined by a role, the doctor, the banker, uh, the labourer, etc. And, uh, and that label kind of um, restricts your uh, uh, hopes and aspirations. Um, <coughs> so uh, if I aspire to be interesting, uh, but it, uh, I also aspire to a certain, to be unrecognised or un, uh, uh, undefined. Thank you. Well, time dictates that we need to draw to a close, and I'd like to end by thanking the Museum and the British Council for inviting us to be here. Also to thank all of you for coming and for bringing so many, dare I say it, interesting questions. Um, but most importantly, I'd really like to thank Richard for sharing so much of his ideas and working practices with us. So thank you very much. And thank you for being such a great audience.